Hi everyone, this is Uli at Lulu Island Wastewater Treatment Plant. So this is the part of your tour where I take you around and show you some video clips of the different process units in our plant. Uh, you will have just heard a short description of the plant and how it works. You will have some guidelines that have been given to you on what we expect for you to learn from this tour. I wish you could be here so you could smell the full aroma and have the full experience. But the advantage of doing a video tour is actually that you can see more in the same time. So as you see, I'm all outfitted here. Uh, I'm here after work on a Tuesday night. I'm all alone in the plant, so I won't be interrupted by rude colleagues. And in this plant, it's an industrial facility. There are dangers, so we wear full PPE. You have to have steel-toed boots, coveralls, safety glasses, hard hat. Usually you have to wear gloves. And you have a radio to call for help and listen to warnings and stay in communications with the CDACs, the central control room. I'm filming this introductory part from the central control room. And you'll get a tour of it shortly. We're going to give you some quick clips that are all tied together of all the major process units in the plant. So it's a, remember the key points, it's a municipal wastewater treatment plant as opposed to industrial wastewater. So we get mostly water with human waste and the many other pollutants that are in the raw sewage. So we get about 80 megaliters a day. In this plant, it's a medium-sized wastewater treatment plant. It's a Category 4 plant, which means the size of our plant and the population we serve makes us a Category 4 plant or a medium-sized plant. Remember, there are smaller package plants, and there are much larger municipal plants that are 10 or even 100 times the size of this plant. And remember the overall idea I will have given to you already, that there are many ways to treat wastewater. And we are doing this tour so that we can get an overview of how these things are done here. You will find other ways of doing the same thing. So let's start right now because we're in the control room and I'll keep talking as we go. And I may do voiceover for the video that you see. Uh, I'll show you a short view of what we have here in the control room and uh, we get an idea of some of our screens. I'm going to turn the camera on because it's the easiest way to do this. We have many computer screens and monitors. Remember, this is a fully automated facility, and it runs 24 hours a day. And we have an operator here in the daytime and maintenance mechanics, and we tend to trend data on many items here. Uh, you can see the control room actually has about eight or nine stations in the control room. There's a foreman's office right there. And remember, we have about 24 people who work there. About seven or eight operators work in the plant. And the same number of maintenance people and five or six management personnel. We have a control system that often uses these kinds of screens. And I'll just give you a short introduction with this kind of screen. This view allows us to see the completely automated system in the plant. We call it CDAX, Computer Data Acquisition and Control System. And it's grayscale because the new industrial control IT is mostly grayscale. So that color, such as up here in the corner, right up there, indicates there's something wrong. You'll see it up there. Color means the machine is off or something's wrong with it or we need to do something. Uh, there are little symbols, little pictures of things. And you can see tanks. They have a level going up. The engineering units are Système International. That is the metric system to you. Little labels indicate what it is. The bypass gate, the raw influent is right at this moment, 75.9 MLD. You can see that our wet well level is 1.9 meters. Pumps are running at 80%, uh, RPM 576, and so on. And we can 
screen through many, uh, scroll through many of these types of screens. Each one is a graphic representation of what this plant would look like. Of course, we use amps, millimeters, meters, percent, megaliters. And usually there are gray lines connecting everything and they indicate the process flow. So this is an idealized process flow diagram. It's not the way it looks in the real world. It's just easier to represent it this way. Uh, when a pump is lit, it means it's running. When a pump is dark, it means it's off. When there's color, that means maybe the pump is turned off or there's a problem. Of course, you can click on the pump and get a faceplate, much more information. You can manually start and stop it. Right now, our plant has 74 MLD flowing through it. We can trend that. One of our major features here is that we have trending ability. And here you see a trend of the flow in our plant over one day. We can take it over several days. And you will see this repeating pattern. And recognition of repeating patterns is, of course, something that humans do very well. So we call this the camel. This is two humps every day. The morning hump and the midnight hump. The bigger hump is usually the midnight hump. And you can see sometimes something goes wrong with this. Right here, we have a, a peak because something happened with our flow. Maybe somebody turned on extra pumps or a lot more fluid came into the plant. And on top of this, we can add information. We can drag information onto it. And now we can compare to our daily flow, the chlorine level in our disinfection system. And you can see that at low flows, there was a hump here. We can drag in the temperature of our effluent, which is fairly consistent, but let's see. You see there's actually a very mild pattern in the orange line. So we can add information to the graph to give us more information. But the system is automated. The operators are here to maintain it and control it. take a look at the plant overview. The dashboard gives us the plant map. This is the plant map. We can click on any section in the plant and it'll open a graphic of that section. Electrical, polymer, switch gear and boiler, digesters. Let's look at the digesters. It'll open the digester page and you can see there are some colored areas indicating either problems or crucial equipment is turned off. You can see when alarms are inhibited. And then they often have a sub-page on the digesters. In this case, it's a gas that the digesters produce. So it goes on and on. Remember, the gray lines connect process flow, and they often have a directional arrow. All right, everyone, we're outside now. Lulu Island wastewater treatment plant. A few basics. Remember, we are a municipal wastewater treatment plant. That means we treat household wastewater. We do not treat too much industrial waste. Remember that we are receiving waste from a discrete collection system. Sewers just from the house not street drains. Street drains are a separate system that goes into the river. So we treat just sewage and then it goes cleaned into the river. Remember that we work in a regulatory environment. This means we have to prove to the provincial government who gives us the money to operate and taxes for your rent and your property tax to operate. We have to prove that we're working. Step one, take the water from the influent shed over there and sample it so we know what came in and how well we treated it and then we sample at the end so we can prove that we did a good job and remember that all of this is part of the water cycle above me you see clouds today's a very cloudy day and you may see mountains in the distance with snow on them where is it oh there they are snow is falling that will become your coffee tomorrow 
but that will end up here tomorrow night to be treated. It's a wastewater treatment plant. Mostly it's water we treat, mainly because it's easy to use it, uh, to use water as a transport medium. But re always remember, there are many ways to treat waste. We just do it one way here. We tend to do it the expensive first world way. But always remember, there are many ways to do it. Incidentally, while we're out here, take a look across the street. Here's the front of the plant. I guess you can't see it. Behind those trees are our neighbors. They live there. They need, they complain about noise and odors. They moved across the street from a wastewater plant, but they complain anyway. So let's now remember and start the tour. There we go. Five stages of, of um, wastewater treatment. Preliminary treatment is step one. That means screenings removal. That means a uh, grit removal, sand, coffee grounds, eggshells, things that are hard that would ruin our pumps. So let's go inside this building right now. This is the building. Step one, this is preliminary treatment. We're going to go in that door. There's a door back there somewhere. And we're going to take a look at our screens and our grit removal. All right, everyone. We're in the bar screen, the first stage of preliminary treatment at Lulu Plant. So this is a big noisy room, so let's look around. The primary thing we do here is we do screenings of the raw influent to capture rags and bits of string and so on. And we remove the grit. So let's take a look at that. So here you'll see the bar screen room is full of big equipment. And there is a the bar screen. And it goes down a long ways. You're only seeing the very top of it. And there are three of them. One, two, and there's the third one back there. So let's take a look at this room, see what we can see. The bar screen is always the uh, dirtiest and uh, most disgusting part of any wastewater treatment plant. Uh, right now it's pretty dark. See if I can focus in on there. These are the screenings. Yeah, that's pretty hard to see. But here's a, a bar screen dumping its load. It's coming up right now. And we'll watch this uh, relatively ingenious mechanism as it dumps its load. So there it is. It's coming up. Those are the screenings and they're being scraped off. So let's take a look at the actual screen down below. Down below, about 40 feet down, I think, 35 feet down. I gotta hold on to my phone. I don't wanna drop it into the, the soup here. So this is the bar screen. There's the motor. It's kind of like a car that rides along on this track. It rides on uh, that track right there and it has a scraper which is right here and it goes all the way down to the bottom and down there is the raw influence. The water is rushing into the plant. I'm going to zoom in on that. And there is the bar screen. That is the bar screen right there, way down there, there. So the bar screen is about a centimeter apart. And it is just catching rags, tampons, diapers, rope, cell phones, money, anything that falls into the water. Here's one that's just coming down, the next one. And you can see how the mechanism works. The actual bar screen has little wheels that turn and just ride down the track. It does this based on flow. As the flow gets faster, they run more often. And we'll watch this one go all the way to the bottom. It's going way down there. 
pretty dark now, so I don't know if you can see it. And the scraper will just go underwater and scrape the, the screen clean and bring those screenings back up. So now the scraper is going underwater right there. And it's going to rotate right now. There it is. And now it's going to come back up with screenings. And we'll see that in a moment as it dumps them into the, the tray right here. And there's another bar screen here. We'll zoom in on this one. Notice this one has a lot less flow going through it. It's been plugged. So it needs to run to clear this screen. This is what happens when the bar screen isn't operating. So every few minutes, the scraper has to clean the screen. Now the other one beside it is now coming up. Here it is, moving along, riding on the, with these teeth gear on that track. And here are the scrapings. There's some plastic and rags, mostly rags. And of course, grease, and it's being scraped off and it parks. So that's the bar screen way down there and now it's clear and you see the water moving through pretty quickly. So let's take a look at what they look what they're screening. So the screenings get conveyed by augers all the way to the top and dropped into these bins. And these bins are full of screenings and they are horrible. This is exactly what you think it is. Rags, plastic, paper, tin foil, uh, whatever people, there's some masks, a few masks in there because people are dropping those now. <coughs> Grease. So this stuff is dried and put into an incinerator and used to generate electricity because this is actually a good fuel once you dry it out. This room has an incredibly rich aroma of septic smell. You, in one sense, you should be glad you're not here. It's the worst part of the plant in terms of the smell. And some of the things that come in is wallets, cell phones. Here's some money. Somebody dropped a, a 20. I think that's a $5 bill, some plastic, a little naked plastic woman, and just garbage. Literally garbage is flushed sometimes. So, bar screens are critical. If you don't have them, the plant would break down in a few days. So they need to screen these out. Another thing that the preliminary treatment does is remove screenings. And here is another bin of screenings. You see the pile there, the black? That's just eggshells, corn, Plastic, cigarette butts, some credit cards. People cut their credit cards and put them down the toilet. That's just screenings, it's just grit. Sand, corn. This stuff is buried because we don't want that ruining our pumps. That's it. Screenings and grit removal. That's preliminary treatment. And now we move on to primary treatment. Five fingers of the hand, preliminary, primary. So we're going on to the next stage, stage number two. Let's take a look. Five fingers of the hand. So we are on the set tank deck, but part of preliminary treatment is grit removal. And we have six grit tanks, redundant systems side by side. Each one is called a process unit. So we have six process units called grid tanks. Now you won't see much, they're just covered like that. But there's one that's empty. As I told you many times, one system is empty for servicing. So you get to see the empty tank. So we'll do that. There we go. So this is a grid tank that's empty. 
for servicing. Remember, there's a full one with the covers on. And the purpose is to circulate the water. Uh, there are bubbles coming out of a long pipe along the bottom here, and it circulates the water and the heavier grit ends up accumulating in the bottom here. And you see that black sand, that's the grit I'm talking about. Also, there's a mountain of grease in the background. It's part of the reality is that we deal with a lot of grease. Here's another one. It's been cleaned for servicing for people to go inside. And there are the augers, the screws that move the grid along. They turn like big screws and just drag the grease along to this end. Normally it's covered like it is in the background. The big white pipes remove the foul odor air because H2S is released when you aerate sewage. So we need to remove the air and use bacteria to treat it. On the other side of the tank, you see the empty sedimentation tank. So this is a set tank. This is now step two of wastewater treatment, primary treatment. Remember, it removes about half the sewage, uh, half the pollution. This is what it looks like empty. And you see here, the flights, those cross members going across, they go that way on the top and come back the other way on the bottom. So it's just a loop that goes around. And the top part drags grease to the end and the bottom part drags sludge to this end where it is dragged into a sump. I'll show it to you on this side. It gets dragged down there and then it gets dragged sideways into a deep sump where it's pumped out. So remember the fluid comes through these windows, flows all the way through very slowly over several hours to the end. And remember we have several process units, three sedimentation tanks here. They all have a flight drive system to remove sludge and grease. This removes half the pollution. Just by settling out the raw sewage, we remove about half the pollution. Two of Metro Vancouver's plants remove wastewater, uh, uh, clean up wastewater by removing half the sewage with primary treatment only. That's all they do. They don't have any more process to it. But remember, this is a secondary plant. So we do primary treatment. And at the end, those big tanks you see on the horizon, that's secondary treatment. We'll be going out there in a moment. And those are trickle filters and their bacteria remove the second half of the pollution. And remember what I said, the pollution is BOD and TSS biochemical oxygen demand and total suspended solids. So biochemical oxygen demand is the strength of the wastewater. How polluted is it? Well, it's pretty bad. There's a good picture of it. You see, it's kind of clearish greenish with floating grease on top. That's what wastewater looks like. It's very toxic. It's very dangerous. If you drink it, you will get sick or you will die. This is right out of your toilet. So it's very polluted. Interestingly, COVID-19, AIDS, many human diseases don't make it to this point. They would have been destroyed by this time. However, certain diseases do make it to this. Typhus, cholera, uh, hepatitis. Many bacterial infections can make it this far. And if you touch the water and get it in an open wound, you can get very sick and you can die. Here, we see where the grease is collecting at the end. You see the flights are bringing the grease in. It gets collected and these dippers turn every once in a while to capture the floating grease and it's pumped away. So that's how we remove the grease. The grease comes from food, of course, and it is excellent fuel for our digesters. So we burn that in digesters by metabolic digestion and turn it into gas, actually. And in the end, we have a we have a ladder to get down into there, that little drawbridge. And you can see the much clearer. The reason we have a different section here is to remove the floating grease. It's mostly removed now. And somebody left a cabinet open. You need to fire somebody. And I just want to take you over here and show you one other thing. 
So the wastewater is half treated. This is the end of the process right here for primary treatment. Step two is finished right here. It goes out that center launder and it goes on to big pipes to the very end where you see the trickle filters. Step three, which is the biological removal of nutrients. In fact, you can see the big pipes, I believe. Well, it goes down these wells. There are three of them. Everything's repeated in patterns and it flows underground to those big trickle filters you see back there. Those are trickle filters. That is secondary treatment. Primary treatment is finished. Half the pollution is removed. And look at the size of these pipes. These are big pipes, maybe 12, 15 feet in diameter to carry some of the sewage. Each of you would only be half as high as that and some other big pipes. So a lot of the cost of building a wastewater treatment plant is building the piping to bring the sewage there. By the way, we have a lot of effort to remove odors here because we have to be environmentally and socially responsible wastewater operators. So we have to make sure we don't stink up the neighborhood. This machine has plastic media inside, the little foam squares, air is pumped in at the bottom. There is some foam with bacteria growing on it and then it's injected up a stack into the high atmosphere, about 300 feet up through that nozzle. And we are now finished with primary treatment. Preliminary treatment, primary treatment. Half the pollution removed. So now let's end this and go to the next clip, which is secondary treatment, trickle filters, which you see over there. You notice repeating units because it's often smaller to build. It's often cheaper and wiser to build many small units than one gigantic unit. And that allows the plant to expand in the future and allows for units to be taken down for maintenance. So we're gonna walk over there now and I'll click through the magic of video, I'll click you onto the next one. And by the way, keep your eyes open because everybody's left the plant. This is the quiet afternoon time, about five o'clock. And a lot of animals start showing up here. Coyotes, wolverines, foxes, eagles, ducks. What else? Owls. Um, local pets like cats and dogs that go roaming and hunting. This is a happy hunting ground. A lot of animals live here because there's food. What do they eat? You guessed it. Grease and sewage. See you at the trickle filter straight ahead. Okay, everyone. Hope you can see me here. So this is another one of our biofilters. They are using bacteria to remove foul odor from air. So foul odor air. We have four or five of these on site. It's part of our responsibility to be good corporate citizens to try to remove odors. This is an older technology, but it works great. It's just more expensive in the long run to rebuild these every few years. Uh, foul odor air is coming up from the bottom. The bacteria that grow on wet wood eat the hydrogen sulfide that makes most of the odors. And the air coming out smells pretty good. So here you are. Uh, the white poles tell us how much the media has subsided over the years because the bacteria actually digest the wood. So these wood chips have bacteria in them. They, they're sprinkled to make sure they stay wet. The wood chips have bacteria growing on them. The air is coming up through it. A lot in the center section, as you see, it's dried out and the odor is removed very effectively. And already, if you were here, you could smell that the the odor is much better here because it's effective in removing odors. Again, it's another expense that a lot of people don't think about. These fans, these units right here, are just fans moving air from the tops of those trickle filters you see in the background. We can't have foul odor air. There's another reason for this. The air above sewage has something called crown corrosion. The top of a round pipe, such as these pipes you see here, which will become future sewage pipes. If you imagine these pipes 
half full of sewage. There are some big ones and there are some little ones, but if you imagine these pipes half full of sewage, uh, how can we do this? Can you see that? Maybe you can see that. So the pipe will be half full or three quarters full, and but there's air above it. And that air will have condensation on the top part or the crown of the pipe. And there will be hydrogen sulfide in that air, and so it will condense with water and form sulfuric acid, which will dissolve this pipe about a quarter of an inch thick. And remember, the plant cost is minor compared to the cost of putting in all the piping. The piping is what costs lots of money. So this plant, remember, costs about a billion dollars to replace. But the piping would probably be seven or eight billion dollars to dig up all the streets in Richmond and all the streets in Vancouver to replace all these pipes underground. These ones are steel. I don't know if you can see this. They're about a quarter of an inch thick steel. They have a coating on the outside and on the inside. They're plastic lined. But they have a limited life. Newer pipes are made of plastic and they have theoretically a much longer life. In the old days, they used pipes made of wooden staves, like a, a wine barrel. In ancient times, they actually used ceramic pipe made out of clay. And surprisingly, those have lasted thousands of years and some of them are still in use in Italy. So these big structures you see that we're walking up to are trickle filters. They are not big tanks full of water. They look like it, but they're not. These are reactors, bioreactors for bacteria. We have four of them. One is out of service. Their job is to remove BOD. They're full of plastic squares, which I showed you in the lecture. And this provides a surface for bacteria to grow on. And the water cascades down over this surface. It trickles. These are called trickle filters. They're huge. I mean, my head doesn't even reach the top of this hatch. And the surface area inside each of these is square kilometers because of the plastic media inside. So many bacteria can grow here. They do most of the work. They remove the pollution from the wastewater. We're gonna take a stairway up to the top of one of these, look in the little door, and you'll get an idea of what it's like. So just to give you an idea, I'm not even reaching the top of this sign. This is looking up. My head is about the bottom of this sign. So you can imagine, my head is the bottom of that sign. These are huge filters, but they're a really effective way to remove pollution. They remove about 97% of the pollution. That's what this plant removes very effectively. So let's take a look at the top and see what a working trickle filter looks like. This is a part where a lot of people can't stand to look inside because it's dark and it's hard to see and it's stinky. But this is a biofilm that grows on the surface of the plastic modules. These big pipes, they're huge. Again, my head reaches the bottom of this valve. So these are big pipes. They supply oxygen to the bacteria. <coughs> That's the whole point. We're climbing up the stairway to the top of this one. And they provide oxygen for the bacteria because these bacteria are attached growth and they will convert in a biofilm the soluble BOD into bacterial bodies, which are then washed out. And soluble BOD is very simply sugar water. Just a view of the mountains here. Remember, those are the mountains that have the snow that feeds all of Metro Vancouver. And it's raining in them right now. And these are the domes of these big roofs. And here's the one across. And that one is open because it's being serviced. Let's open this door and see what we see. I hope you can see this. 
thick as that. So this is a trickle filter. You see it's not full of water. It's got plastic cubes in it. And it's uh, water being sprayed over the surface. There it is. That's raw sewage going into a secondary treatment trickle filter. If you zoom in on this stuff, you may see the slime layer. That slime layer is a biofilm. And those bacteria are very effective at removing up to 97% of all the pollution. And it's a giant distributor arm in there. Let's see if I can zoom out a little. That's the inside view. That's a trickle filter, and it's a very different smell. Okay, now let's go to the other part of secondary treatment. Remember, five fingers of the hand, five fingers of the hand, preliminary, primary, secondary. We're in the secondary part now. Trickle filters and solids contact tanks and clarifiers. Let's take a look at those. Okay, folks, I hope you can see me. We're about to enter a building that's very noisy, the blower building. So I uh, wanna do the talking out here and I'll just show you what I show you inside. I'm gonna go through the building and out the back where I can talk again. You'll see big giant pumps to pump water around. That's one of the things we do. One of our biggest costs is energy to pump water. I'll talk more about that later. Big pumps, energy consumption, and then blowers. Very noisy, you won't hear me. These provide oxygen to the bacteria in the bubble tanks. And you'll see that in a moment. Bacteria in the bubble tanks. So let's go through this building, just look at the big machinery and understand why one of our biggest expenses is maintenance and in fact electricity. So here we go. All right, you probably can't hear me in here. This is the trickle filter pump room. This building pumps to three trickle filters through these big pipes. And they're, you know, pretty big. They're about two feet in diameter, big pumps. Noisy, whining. Lots of electricity on these pumps. All right, here we go. Let's move along. We're in the blower building. We have another control room here. We'll take a quick look. Late at night in a wastewater treatment plant, so the lights are off. You see there's another control room. No one's in there today. The guys are having a confab and more control consoles. It's all locked up, so we'll leave it that way. Let's take a look at the blower room, which is next. You need a lot of hearing protection here, so we'll just walk through it. You probably can't hear me, but these are big centrifugal blowers. The air comes in that big shaft at the back through a muffler into the blower. The stages are compression, so it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. It goes out into a manifold through the wall and out to the bacteria. So we'll just walk through here. We have to get out there. There are cranes in these places and bay doors and lots of mechanical equipment. Sound padding on the walls because it's very noisy in here. Again, big motors. 300 horsepower motors, big centrifugal blowers. It's uh, the cost of doing business. All right, we're leaving the blower building and we're walking out to the solids contact tank. Let's take a look. Hope you can still see this. All right, solids contact tanks or bubble tanks. What's happening here? Well, remember, in those big trickle filters, 
the bacteria remove up to 97% of the pollution. That's a trickle filter. That's a pump house, big pumps. And the water, once it passes through there, is fairly clean, although it looks very dirty. It's full of bacteria. But the pollution has been turned into bacterial bodies. By the way, there's a big ship passing because we are on a river, are receiving water, and they're bringing probably Hyundai cars from, from Korea to Canada. It goes right by our plant. That's our receiving water. Their treated water goes into the Fraser River. So back to the bubble tanks. The purpose of putting air bubbles through these tanks is to give the bacteria a chance to come together. If you just have bacteria that are growing in water, they will never settle because of Brownian movement. They will float in the water forever. But we let them grow with oxygen into something called phlox, F-L-O-C. Now phlox are like little snowflakes that fall very slowly, very slowly, hours. But in 30 minutes, most of them will settle. So that's what we're doing. We're putting oxygen in so they grow these big snowflakes. Well, they're about a millimeter and they settle later in the clarifiers. Here we're growing the snowflakes. And I'll show you an empty solids contact tank because one is down for servicing. This one is full. This one is full. <laughs> and don't fall in. We can throw you a life ring, but it's not a good idea. And here we are, an empty one. This one is down for servicing. There's a scaffolding at the end. I don't know if you can see that. The, the round white and black things are diffusers. So air comes out of those and makes the bubbles. Gives the bacteria a chance to grow snowflakes. And they are lots and lots, about a thousand in each tank. And these are akin to an air stone in an aquarium. If you've ever seen an aquarium, it has a little blue stone with an airline and it makes bubbles. That's what's happening here because we want to grow bacteria. Now, if you were here, you could smell. Again, it's a different smell. At this point, the horrible septic smell from primary treatment way in the beginning that we came through was turned into the trickle filters, a different smell, but still not too nice. We were up there on top of this one. And now we're at the solids contact tank. There's an empty one and there's a full one. And we're making bubbles to grow snowflakes. Here, the smell is much better. It's not great, but it's more like a garden. If you smell dirt in a garden, it's like this. It's a humus smell. It's actually pretty good. Now, you'll notice there's a construction site here. And before we walk away, let's take a look at it. And here we are building a new cryogenic gas scrubbing facility. Because in our digesters, those big tanks over there, we're not there yet, but we'll, we'll talk about these big tanks, our digesters, and the bacteria, different bacteria, digest all that grease I showed you earlier. And they make gas. And there are flares burning some of the gas. I don't know if you can see it today. It's actually there, but it's very clear burning. And this facility will scrub that gas and sell it to Fortis, the local gas utility here. So uh, we're going to use cryogenics to condense the gas and condense the impurities like water and silane gas and carbon dioxide gas and we're going to sell it to the gas utility. So it's part of the dream, which is to close the loop. And I'll talk more about that during the lecture in the class. But back to our solids contact tank, since we're, we're walking along here and I'm trying to follow the process, you know? You know, in mountain biking, I used to be a mountain biker. They have a saying, follow the water. If you're going down a mountain, which path to take? Very simple, follow the water. If you were to dump a bucket of water on the ground wherever it's flowed that's where you should ride your bike because that's really the easiest path down the mountain so this is the end of the solids contact tank i'll give you another overview remember the purpose now we're still in secondary treatment five fingers of the hand preliminary primary 
secondary. We're still in secondary. This is a trickle filter in the background, the blower building with the noisy machines there, and the solids contact tank to make bubbles in order to grow bacterial flock, which is snowflakes. And once you stop stirring up this water, it'll settle out right away. And in a moment, you may actually be able to see the flock because it's a clear day and it may show up. So if you look at this water, it looks very muddy. So this brings up another point. This water is muddy, but it's not necessarily bad. It's not as polluted now as it was. But this is just muddy because it's full of bacteria. If you filter out the bacteria, actually. So if you filter out the bacteria, this water is actually very clean. And you'll see that in a moment. The next step in the process, process flow diagram is clarifiers. We have four, one empty, three in service, and this is what a clarifier looks like. It's usually big and round. The water comes up from the bottom in the middle. It follows a complicated path underwater that you can't see, and it comes out these weirs here much much clearer this is the same water you just saw in the solids contact tank so now it's been treated and we're going to go out on that walkway and take a look remember our purpose in wastewater treatment is to remove biochemical oxygen demand and we did that with primary treatment about half we did that in these trickle filters about the second half. And now we're forming flocks to remove total suspended solids. There's the stairway so the maintenance crews can go down in there and do servicing of these air diffusers. Okay. <laughs> and most instrumentation, most industrial processes will have lots and lots of instrumentation. This is a Mixed liquor suspended solids meter, 1,410 milligrams per liter. And that's pretty good. That tells us how cloudy the water is. Everything is labeled. Lulu analyzer indicator transmitter, area 41, which is this solids contact tank, and unit number 064A. Everything is labeled, everything is organized because it needs to be maintained. So the, what is it, 1409 right now, this material in the solids contact tank has a suspended solid content of 1409 milligrams per liter total suspended solids. And in a moment, it'll go right down to four milligrams per liter total suspended solids. So let's take a look at that. We'll look at some of these clarifiers. I've seen many clarifiers all over the world. They all look about the same. We have some ducks here. Lots of ducks in the clarifiers because they like to eat the filter flies that grow in there. Let's go to a different clarifier because we have an empty one beside a full one and it's always good to see different process units like that. So we'll go to the next one over. And we'll take a site overview but here you see a clarifier, there's a duck. These ducks are food for eagles and owls that come here at night. They like to come here because it's a warm place to swim. This water is a bit warm. It's about 21 degrees and in the winter, that's the warmest water around. There's a view, side view of that digester I spoke of. Let's look at this last clarifier. That's what we're going to look at. So clarifier is the end of secondary treatment. The first part of secondary treatment removes biochemical oxygen demand, BOD. The second part removes total suspended solids. Here's an empty one, let's take a look. <coughs> Remember these clarifiers are process units and they are duplicate systems, redundant systems. Lots of pigeons live here food for eagles the clarifier has just been serviced this is the collector dry the top part 
collects anything that's floating and the bottom part scrapes the sludge out. It goes into these weirs. These are effluent weirs. They are notched and it goes out that tube to the rest of the plant. And we'll go there in a moment. But we're almost at the end of the treatment process. So this is what an empty clarifier looks like. And these are some of the best clarifiers I've seen in my life in terms of performance. They work extremely well. Many days, like today, we're probably at 99% removal of total suspended solids. You put cloudy, muddy water in here, comes out pretty clear. There's a lot of internal structure. There's a lot of science. It goes up and down through several of these bands, but eventually comes up at the, where is it? There is the weir and then out and out that tube. So it's quite clear. And the whole point is to leave the flock behind. The flock will settle. And I, I think I've shown you that in the class presentation. So let's look at a full one here. This should be obvious. I know some of you are getting thirsty. All right, let's take a look at this effluent. So this is actually much cleaner now than it looks. It's not crystal clear, it's not perfect. But one of our goals is to make clear water, remove total suspended solids. That's pretty good. Today, the total suspended solids are probably about four or five milligrams per liter. Remember, before this process unit, it was 1,409 something process unit, uh, uh, milligrams per liter. And this is that stuff coming in from the other one. And you see how cloudy it is compared to the side. This is the raw mixed liquor coming in. Don't fall in, I have a life ring, but I don't want to use it. And you see the little dots in the water? That's flock. See those little dots? They're about a millimeter and they're flocks. You can sometimes see them. I'll hold the camera still. Those are flocks forming and they will settle pretty quickly Yep, right there. About one millimeter. And they will settle and stay at the bottom and be pumped back. So this is a clarifier. This is the secondary treatment clarifier. The ducks are all sleeping happily tonight. Oops, zoom you out here. Lots of happy ducks. Lots of wildlife here. Crows, ducks. Eagles, foxes. Here we have now the end of secondary treatment. And I wanted to show you this because five fingers of the hand, preliminary, primary, and secondary. Two left, disinfection and dewatering. But look at the footprint. This entire side of the plant here, from there, Listen, these two digesters, there are two of these giant tanks. They go deep underground. All of this part of the plant is called dewatering. It's where we take all that sludge and grease I've been talking about, and we digest it and reduce its volume by about half. And then we use centrifuges to squeeze the water out of it. And we put it in trucks and we ship it to ranches and construction sites and gravel pits and mining sites that need to reclaim land. So this is a big part of the footprint of the plant. There's our generator building out there and our disinfection system with these two gray tents. And we'll end up there. And that's it for the tour. So let's go down inside the basement of this big building and just show you what's underground because a big part of the plant is underground. You don't see it. You don't really see many pumps or anything. You see big tanks of water. But where are all the pipes? Where are all the pumps? Well, it's all underground. Galleries, we call them. And there are two levels below us and even three levels. And we call them galleries. And why are they underground? Because centrifugal pumps need to be primed to work. And if they're under the water level, as soon as you open a valve, they're flooded and they're always primed. So they're underground and they're protected. So let's go down there and I'll pick up the video there. 
Okay, folks, I hope you're still with me and still awake. We're now in the galleries of Lulu Island Wastewater Treatment Plant. We're walking around downstairs in the basement. There are long galleries that go in all underneath the plant for many meters in all directions. And we're going to walk while we talk. So let's do that. So, here we have cables. Cableways with miles and miles of cables. We have pumps. Centrifugal pumps. This is a progressive cavity pump. There's a motor. There's a gearbox. And that long light blue tube is a progressive cavity. It's like a big screw turning slowly in there. And it pushes thick sludge or something with the consistency of toothpaste. And here all the pipes are labeled. Digested sludge. DS circulation. Here's a centrifugal pump. A motor, a drive belt, a gearbox and the pump itself. Every pump has an inlet isolation valve, a vibration isolation, there's the vibration isolation, and check valves and more isolation valves. Lots of piping everywhere. This is a bit steam pump. Steam pump. You know, pipes and gauges everywhere. It's what keeps this place grow going. All the action is underground. So this is a digester. You saw a little bit of them poking up above the ground. It's insulated. And it is full of water. It is full of black water. It looks like Coca-Cola in there. And the bacteria are eating the sludge and converting it to gas. And the purpose we do that, the purpose for us doing that, is to produce gas that can be sold. We burn that gas in our boilers to make heat and heat our process. And turn on some lights here. Uh, and to reduce the volume of sludge we have to truck, one of our big expenses is trucking. So we're in the basement now, and the floor of the basement is just a little above sea, lo sea, water, sea level. And remember, there's another level below here. And that one is actually below sea level. And we have a ruler here. I keep track of the water levels. And you can see what the water level was outside the wall on certain dates. And you can see, actually, over the years, it has leaked. So well, somebody didn't believe me. So we drilled holes in the wall. And you can see that was the water level on that day. So we drilled more holes. And it was up to about there. So we do have leaks in these walls. The groundwater is higher than the seawater level. So in December, the groundwater level is about up to here. And uh, I would be underwater if I was standing outside the wall. These are big pumps. These are progressive cavity pumps. Big drive motor, gear. This is the pump. This is the actual pump. It's a pipe with a big screw turning in it, moving the sludge along. Okay? There's just miles and miles of uh, galleries down here. We'll go a little further. We'll see what we can see. It's a little less noisy today. A lot of uh, unique engineering going on. Piping everywhere. Lots of cableways. Big chillers to cool our computer rooms because we have a lot of computers that run this automated plant. Pumps, pipes, everything is laid out in, in pairs or more. They're redundant systems. You'll often see two of everything because we need pairs of everything so they can be shut down for servicing. So now we're going into the darker spooky section, unless I can find a light switch here. No light switch. Oh well, get used to the dark. Polymer chemical dosing. 
for our centrifuges. And uh, I just want to show you that there are actually expansion joints everywhere because the plant is built in delta sediments. That means the entire gallery and buildings have to move. Here's an example. Let's go to this joint over here. The pipes go along the gallery, but where there is movement along the rubber joints between the sections of the gallery, there have to be flexible joints in the pipes. And here is such a joint. This black line on the floor is a joint. And you can see all the precautions that have to be taken to allow airlines and big pipes to have flexible sliding joints. Lots of precautions to allow grounding to be carried out. Everything has to be flexible here because the sections move. They're like a bunch of barges tied together. So now let's go upstairs and look at the centrifuges and we're almost done with the tour. We use something called daft here all their flotation. Basically, if you've ever seen someone shake a bottle of champagne and then pop the cork, that's what these dafts do. We're popping the cork and inside is full of foam. That's how we get rid of a lot of the floating protein that's in the water. This is a big tank from the outside, but it's kind of cool to see what's inside. White foam. So let's go upstairs and we'll look at center future. All right, folks, we're back. Here's another one of these control rooms. I'm afraid you can't see much, but we have several of these throughout the plant and they're all locked up. And of course, lots of COVID-19 restrictions. And uh, we don't want anyone walking into these rooms and start flipping switches. So this is the centrifuge hall. We have two centrifuges. One of them's running so you won't be able to hear me. I don't think you can hear me, but this is a centrifuge with its dry motors. And here we make something called cake. No, you can't eat it. But I'll show you what it looks like. It smells good. It's kind of like black soil and it will be used to make soil. This is what we put. This came out of the digester, will go into a truck and be used to reconstitute farmland and mining land. All right, let's go outside where it's a little quieter and we're near the end of the tour. One more stop at the final effluent and the walking part of the tour i know you're all exhausted will be over here we are outside again tour is almost over these are the tops of those daft units champagne bottle pop the cork it's white foam inside to help remove whatever can be removed with foam generator building with a fuel tank primary sludge thickener. All these vessels I show you are process units. The piping is underground. Many of the process units have duplicate systems. There are many of them. <coughs> we have two generators, four clarifiers, four trickle filters, four solids contact tanks, two centrifuges, oh, three sedimentation tanks, and so on. Two transformers. This is our administration building and here we're near the end of the process. So 
So here's a quick overview. The first tent over there, we add chlorine. It's the same thing as bleach, except it's about four or five times as strong. And this kills the bacteria. It blows them up. And here we add sodium bisulfite. Sodium bisulfite is a chemical that reacts with the bleach to make some salt. And the purpose is to remove the chlorine so that the fish are not harmed. What we end up with is clean water that ends up in the river. It is clear. It has a lot of the solids removed. It has uh, got the soluble pollution removed because the bacteria and the trickle filters ate that pollution. And it needs time. So these are called chlorine contact tanks. It comes down this way, goes back the middle and comes back the final channel right here. And this is the final product. It looks black to you, but if you were to hold it in a glass, and I think I showed you that, it's actually quite clear. That's pretty clear. And I think I'll show it to you in a glass. And remember, it has very few bacteria in it. They've been killed. It has no pathogens in it. It goes into the Fraser River. Over there where you saw the ship. Over there. And that is our receiving water. Again, a sampler shed because we are required to sample. There's a sampler right there to prove that we're treating our wastewater. And just so you don't call me a liar, because I know you all want to call me a liar. Here is our final effluent total suspended solids. It should be about six. 5.5 milligrams per liter. We're allowed to put out 45, 45. That means 45 milligrams per liter of biochemical oxygen demand and 45 milligrams per liter of total suspended solids. And we're putting out 5.5 milligrams per liter of total suspended solids. So we can prove to the regulatory authorities that we're doing a great job. It came in at about 240 milligrams per liter, went up to, I forget, 1400 milligrams per liter in the bubble tanks and now it's down to five because it's gone through the clarifiers and this is the black hole this is why the water goes through a big pipe and you do not want to fall in there deep under the river and it goes way out there where you saw the ship and is diluted through a dispersion structure out there so there you have it. This is the outside part of the tour. You should have had a tour inside. And now we're gonna flip back to the in-person part of the tour.